We'll start by introducing our speakers tonight, inshallah, before we move to our first session by Brother Haytham, inshallah. Um, our first panelist, Brother Haytham. Haytham Al Sayyid uh, is the global head of institutional sales and advisory services uh, at Wahid. He joined, he's recently joined Wahid Investment as the new global head of institutional sales and advisory services. His responsibilities include solidifying Wahid's footprint in the institutional and retail space, in addition to building the firm's global advisory services team. Al Sayed brings a wealth of experience in ethical investing to the role. He has held multiple senior leadership roles at global financial institutions, and most recently at Satana Capital. He managed the Amana Mutual Funds Trust, working with high net worth clients and financial advisory groups, including endowments, nonprofits, and businesses. He earned his bachelor's degree from the University of California, Irving in pre-med social sciences, and his MBA from Thunderbird, the School of Global Management. Haitham is, a passionate, is passionate about education and helping the communities and he has served on various nonprofit boards. He's married with two children and enjoys traveling, football, and mentoring and connecting people. Our second panelist, Sheikh Badru Jafar, a well known Sharia scholar in Kenya, uh, currently the Sharia coordinator and secretary to the Sharia supervisory board at DIB, Dubai Islamic Bank, Kenya Limited. Sheikh Badru Jafar is a certified Sharia advisory and auditor with 14 years experience in the Islamic finance and banking industry. Sheikh Badru has served in various Sharia boards of Islamic banks in Kenya. He has a BA in Hadith from the Islamic University of Medina and a master's degree in Islamic banking, finance and management from the Macfield Institute of Higher Learning uh, higher education, UK validated by Gloucestershire University. Shukran. Um, we'll go to the next uh, panelist, inshallah, where after the introduction, after the first session by Brother Haytham. Shukran. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Jazakallah khair, Brother Omar, for the nice introduction. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Um, joining you here from uh, Southern Sunny California. Uh, where uh, my home is open to you anytime you'd like to visit. Um, as uh, Brother Omar mentioned, I am um, new to Wahid, but not new to the business. Uh, Wahid is the uh, uh, global um, robo, Islam, first Islamic global um, robo advisor um, uh, in the space. Uh, we are known for being a low cost index product provider. I'll uh, share with you a screen. Um, uh, slides um, to give you some history about who Wahid is and the products that we offer. And then I believe at the end, uh, we will save all the questions um, uh, towards the end when all the panelists are done. So bear with me here. Uh, let me see if I can, can someone make me a host? I think I was a host uh, so I can share my screen. Brother Omar or Ro, can I uh, get? Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Zakhla Khan. This will bear with me here. Okay. Sorry, my. Uh... I don't know why this is not working. Let me see. For some reason, I'm having uh, issues. But uh, as as I as I talk, I'm I'm gonna try to share my screen. I know it's not giving me the uh, availability to share screen. I apologize on that. But I'll 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 just go uh, and continue talking. 
Um, so um, um, uh, we, uh, we, the story started in 2015, our CEO, Junaid Wahadina, um, who had just finished his uh, business school was riding an Uber in New York and um, uh, happened to be a Muslim driver and they had a conversation about savings in general. And, uh, you know, he asked him, how are your savings? And, you know, he's like, well, I just put it in the, in the mattress and, you know, because no one's offering uh, anything halal or I can get into anything because all the minimums are too high. So the idea sparked um, uh, with, our, with our founder, Junaid Wahadina, to uh, come up with a, um, a fintech uh, platform where anybody in, 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 in anywhere in the, in the world eventually can open an investment account to save for future needs, uh, for retirement, for whatever goal they might have, and to have a, 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 you know, a no barrier to entry. Basically, our cost of entering is only $100 across the, 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 the globe. Uh, so in 2017, we had our U.S. launch. 2018, uh, we launched uh, in the U.K. And in 2019, we launched the first halal equity ETF uh, on NASDAQ um, called HLAL. That's the ticker symbol. So it's halal HLAL. Um, by 2000, we had 100,000 clients globally. And 2021, uh, we crossed 200,000 uh, clients globally. And we have offices in different parts of the world. Um, um, and, and we just launched a representative partnership in Nigeria and Africa, our first one, and we're planning to expand as well to um, provide more offerings. Uh, to talk about Halal, um, H-L-A-L, the ticker symbol, um, this, um, this is an index product. So basically we are not stock picking, we are picking indices uh, that provide Sharia compliant uh, portfolios or, or investments. Uh, now, we in the HLAL, it does benchmark to the FTSE Sharia US index. So it's primarily focused on US stocks. 85% of it is on large cap uh, stocks. Uh, so these are companies with over 10 billion in uh, market valuation. Um, and 15% of the uh, ETF is focused on mid cap stocks. So a little bit below that. Um, we. Um, um, the, the index focuses mostly on health and technology. About 56% of the index is on health and technology sector, uh, followed by auto and energy, about 16%. And uh, since inception, the, the, the ETF has returned the total return uh, since 2019 of 71.5% versus your S&P market of 57%. Now, I know the market has been good, the launch of the ETF has been um, uh, well as well uh, because of the market. Uh, but you can, you know, there is a myth out there that these type of funds that, you know, are uh, faith-based or um, ESG, which I'll talk about in a second, which stands for environmental social governments, uh, typically don't do as well as the market. And this is proof that not only our funds, but other funds as well have, have outpaced the market. And Remember, you cannot compare it to the market apples for apples uh, because you know the market will include, you know, banking and riba-related companies which we don't uh, invest in, um, uh, or uh, you know, companies that deal with alcohol, pornography, and so forth. Uh, so uh, you know, keep that in mind as as you're looking to um, you know uh, purify or get into halal investments um, now or in the future. I'm quickly going to mention our other ETF. Uh, we just launched um, uh, in January of this year. So, you know, talk about timing. I mean, if this was launched back in July of 2019, we would be having a different discussion on performance, but obviously the market has been down. Um, uh, the UMMA, U-M-M-A, um, is the ticker symbol for it. Uh, this one, not only is it a halal uh, index, but also it's an environmental social governance uh, so we're not only trying to avoid the bad uh, in avoiding certain industries or markets uh, or companies, but we're also buying in the good, making sure that there's ethical boards on the companies, uh, that there's um, you know, uh, good uh, uh, sustenance on environmental and social and human rights uh, views. And this is a more active uh, ETF uh, management versus the halal is more passive. Um, here, there's the, the portfolio manager is actually looking at, you know, um, because there's an ESG lens, uh, they're looking at ma making sure 
um, that you know they are buying the right companies and the right uh, allocation in those companies. Um, um, this is XUS stock, so this is giving you opportunity to buy uh, companies like Samsungs and LGs, uh, you know, the TV makers, manufacturers in South Korea. Um, uh, most of the investments are in Japan, uh, Switzerland, and other countries. Uh, the benchmark for this is the Dow Jones Islamic uh, Market uh, Index. It has a, about 102 companies in it. Also focus on healthcare and technology, about 50% um, of it. Uh, now we, uh, the, the big question is probably, you know, how are we Sharia compliant? So just so you know, um, the two indices that we follow, the FTSE and the Dow Jones Islamic are already embedded through a Sharia compliant board. Uh, the FTSE uses Yasar um, Sharia board that are already, you know, has, uh, you know, qualified the indice as a, a Sharia compliant indices. That means the companies that they're following are Sharia compliant. However, we have also an independent Sharia compliant board uh, compromise of three scholars um, that also uh, uh, view it. So we have two layers of, of Sharia compliancy on our practices, on what we're buying, what we're doing and transacting. Um, and we also follow IOFI standards. And as many of you might know, IOFI is the auditing and accounting um, organization of Islamic uh, financial institutions based in Bahrain. And so um, our, our Sharia independent uh, board members also um, have a seat and we are also members of IOFI. So we have multiple layers uh, and we have certificates, certifications on our website to indicate you know, that we are Sharia compliant on the uh, operations and, and stocks that we buy and, and indices that we buy. Um, with that, I think I will uh, pause here and turn it over to the next panelist, and then I'm happy to answer any questions because I know we are uh, started a little bit late and we have a short time. So um, I'll turn it over to the next panelist, please. Shukran Jazeelan. Um, Sheikh Badru Jafar. Uh, can you hear me? So, inshallah, would like to hear your opinion about. Um, can Muslims invest? What should a Muslim look for before investing? And um, do I have to do Sharia screening for investing as a Muslim? And about Sharia screening, can anyone learn about Sharia screening? Shukran. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Salatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa Thank you very much, uh, Brother Omar, and uh, thanks to Brother Haitham uh, for that introduction uh, about uh, indices and what they do at uh, Al Wahid. Uh, I think uh, the two questions that have been posed to me one is um, can a Muslim uh, invest, of course. Uh, as Muslims, we are advised, and uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam maybe uh, to just give um, uh, an example uh, from the Hadith that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that uh, I do not fear for you al faqr I do not fear for you poverty, but rather I fear that the world is going to be opened uh, for you and you're going to, you know, uh, compete over amassing uh, wealth. So this is something that is bound to happen that uh, Alhamdulillah Muslims are going to be uh, rich, they are going to be affluent and uh, all that. But uh, what the Prophet Sallallahu says is that he fears that when this happens, you know, uh, getting or amassing wealth becomes easy, then people are going to compete and uh, so to say they are going to forget about their akhirah. And then there's also another hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam warns us that there will come a time where people will not uh, care where their wealth is from, whether it is, whether it is from halal uh, sources or from haram uh, sources. So as we are discussing this, it is important to note that uh, what, it, what is at stake when we discuss about wealth or when we discuss about investments, is uh, another hadith again uh, where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, "Ayu jasadin ghuzdiya bil harami fa naru ahakubihi." Every flesh that is nourished from haram 
it deserves to enter hellfire. So it is important for us to be worried, concerned that whatever we consume, our sources, our source of uh, sustenance mm -hmm. is halal. This is very important for us because it is a matter of you know, going to Jannah or going to hell, billah, Allah uh, forbid me, Allah uh, protect each one of us. Mm -hmm. So yes, it is very important for us to invest. It is, uh, it is an obligation on each one of us to actually uh, look for uh, halal sustenance, halal income to feed yourself, to feed your dependents, to feed your family. And again here, uh, another hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was uh, walking with some of his companions and they saw a young man. And the picture that comes from this hadith is this young man, mashallah, he was um, uh, young and you know energetic and strong. And the Sahabas looked at him and it's, it's as if they, they thought that he was wasting his energy and you know, uh, his youth uh, in whatever he was doing. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told them that if he left his house to fend for himself, فَهُوَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ They actually said, why doesn't he use you know, his energy, his youth uh, to fight for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala? And the Prophet ﷺ told them that if he has left his house to fend for his himself and his family, فَهُوَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ If he has left his house to fend for his parents, فَهُوَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ If he has left his uh, house to fend for his children, فَهُوَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ He is in the way of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So yes, it is imperative for each one of us to go out and look, you know, for halal uh, sustenance. Now, coming to uh, the question of uh, uh, of uh, investments, yes, we are supposed to uh, look for what is halal, <clears throat> because if we do not look uh, for halal and we eat haram or consume haram, then uh, apart from uh, the fact that we have said in the hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu says, uh, if uh, any flesh that is nourished from haram, it deserves to enter hellfire, your prayers are not going to be answered. We also know a hadith that refers to that. Now, uh, since we are in this era where uh, companies and firms uh, have you know, a portfolio or portfolios that consist of halal and haram, then it becomes more uh, of an obligation on each one of us when we are uh, you know, out there looking for uh, sustenance that we make sure that inshallah ta'ala whatever we consume or we feed our families is, is purely uh, halal. And this is where the issues of uh, screening comes into play. Uh, there are two ways of screening. Uh, the, the first one is uh, qualitative. And qualitative, simply, you just look at the nature of that business. If the business is halal, so for example, it is transportation. Uh, in Kenya, we have uh, companies like K Kenya, uh, Kenya Airways. Uh, so transportation or, you know, is just halal. You're taking people from Kenya to America or any other country, that is halal. But even though it is a, it is a, it is a company that, you know, uh, ferries people from you know country to country or town to town they also would be selling uh, liquor they would also be selling pork and this is where now you'd come to the second type of uh, uh, screening and this is quantitative you would be looking at uh, is there any non uh, sharia compliant income that they make so that is one uh, screen uh, that you would also employ to make sure that um, the, the, the income from uh, haram sources is less than 5%. Uh, because of time, we will not uh, go into how we come about with the 5% or the 30, 33%. So this is one of the screens, uh, a screening methodology that uh, is employed. Uh, the third one, we've said the qualitative, you just look at the nature of the business. The core business is halal. So yes, this passes and you would say that, yes, I can invest in this. Uh, second is the quantitative where we'll be looking at different ratios. One of the ratios is uh, non-halal uh, income. 
uh, so for example, pork or alcohol. Then there's also interest. You'd also be looking at that. And another one, you'd also be looking at the liquidity ratio or liquid uh, to illiquid assets. And you would be looking at this because uh, one, of course, if there is in interest income, then it would also, it would be haram, but then we have uh, a limit or a ratio that we can work with. Um, and then number three is, uh, we've said uh, liquidity. <clears throat> if the company has illiquid assets, <clears throat> so it has, uh, uh, plants, uh, it has buildings, uh, motor vehicles, and what have you. And then there's also cash. You'd be looking at the ratio of that cash vis-a-vis uh, -vis this uh, illiquid asset. And then, of course, if it is leveraged, it has a debt, uh, you know, uh, and, and uh, that debt should not be more than, you know, 33%. So these are some of the um, uh, of the screens or the ratios that are employed to make sure that whatever uh, investment that you make, then that company is indeed Sharia compliant. Probably the most important thing, uh, apart from what I've just mentioned, is that once we employ these ratios or screen screens, it is important for us to know that as laymen or as people who are not uh, legislators would be depending on publicly available information. And this means that the ratios might change while we do not have the information um, available to us on a daily basis. And therefore the, 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 the investment might have turned haram while we are oblivious to the fact that the company that we invested or the stocks that we are holding are no longer Sharia compliant. And this information I got uh, from the Securities Commission uh, in Malaysia when I was uh, there and you know, discussing with them. So uh, the, the, the screening and the ratios are very important, but at individual level, it may be very difficult for one to clearly uh, or rather be confident that this company is Sharia compliant from January to December. Otherwise, if this information you know, is provided uh, uh, at the regulatory level where the regulator, for example, the, uh, the, the CMA in Kenya uh, requires that these companies provide this information on a monthly basis, then we would be confident or comfortable that whatever stocks or whatever uh, screening uh, has been, that has been done to say these companies are Sharia compliant, then we would be comfortable that indeed from January to December, they are Sharia compliant. I think uh, I will end it at that and uh, take up the uh, questions later on. Thank you. Shukran, Jazeel and Ustad. Um, next, we'll uh, introduce our third, fourth, and fifth uh, panelists. Inshallah, a little background on our third, fourth, and uh, fifth panelists. Uh, the third is uh, Mr. Roba Aden, a business risk analyst at Kenyan Kenya. Uh, Roba Aden is a certified public accountant of Kenya and a certified investments and financial analyst. He has in-depth experience in internal audit risk management, quality assurance, and organizational management. Roba has authored many articles published in premier magazines and academic journals. He has addressed corporate workshops and management forums on organizational management, corporate finance, budgeting, among many other topical areas. Uh, his educational background, he's currently doing his PhD in finance at Jequat. He has an MBA in finance at, uh, from the University of Nairobi. He's a certified investment and financial, financial analyst. He's a certified public accountant. Um, our fourth panelist is Robert Ochieng, the CEO and co-founder of Abojan Investment. He has helped over 5,000 Africans get started in investing. Ocheng is renowned for his ability to break down and demystify money and investments in a way that is relevant for all. He has been featured on Forbes Africa, Radio Citizen, Metropole TV, Saturday Magazine by the Nation Media Group. He runs an investment community with over 300,000 people. The last uh, panelist is Ro Nyangeri, 
the COO and co-founder of Ndovu Fund. Uh, Rogito Oro Nyangeri is the co-founder and chief commercial officer of Ndovu. He boasts over 19 years experience in investment banking, investment advisory, capital markets, private equity, and strategy consulting. Previously, he was the COO of a two billion Sino-Africa private equity fund. Prior to this, he was the head of strategy at the National Security, uh, Nairobi Securities Exchange, where he oversaw the demutualization and IPO of the BAUs in 2014. It was during his tenure that the NSC issued the world famous M. Akiba treasury bond. Ro holds an MA distinction in Islamic banking and finance and was the first holder of the groundbreaking Islamic finance qualification in Sub Saharan Africa. He is also an alumnus of Judge Business School, University of Cambridge, Columbia Business School, and Cornell University. Um, Mr. Roba, Bismillah, um, you can join us if you can hear me, and inshallah, you can pick it up from there. Shukran. Okay, thank you very much, Omar. So guide me on the questions uh, since I got disconnected a few minutes ago. So what challenges do you face when you train Muslims on investment and in, uh, personal finance? And uh, how can investment classes help one be financially independent? Thank you. Thank you very much, Omar. So I can see a few people from our community who have joined. So usually the challenge that we have with the Muslim community, as you are aware, uh, we have over 10 million Muslims in Kenya, but currently in our capital market, the way it is structured, even the stock exchange, uh, there's very little consideration uh, for them. And that's the opportunity now for us. And that's why we're here. Uh, so what we are doing is to partner uh, with uh, platforms and people with tools such as Dovu so that you can bring to Muslims halal investments. And then on top of that, we bring the expertise uh, of the panelists here and even who are ahead so that they can give Muslim uh, information in a language that is relatable to them and they can invest uh, peacefully knowing that they're investing halal investments. So the biggest challenge of course is the traditional investments that we have. You know, they are very big on riba and that is usually sometimes the reason why people got getting attracted to investments. So, so I think this platform is great and it will help us solve a lot of problems and uh, be able to now authoritatively uh, give direction to the Muslim community uh, in safe environments where they can invest and then grow their wealth over time. So I think uh, just like the previous speakers have shared, so I think uh, Badru shared that uh, one thing that uh, we need to you need to look at of course it's not just uh, unique to Muslims is that we need to invest for our lineage we need to invest for, for our family members and grow the people that we love and there's a lot of distraction out here you can get all the trophies in the world you can be the president of the biggest organizations in the world or country uh, we can be in top 40 under 40 we can be celebrities online on social media but few people usually look at their lineage. For me, I believe that is the biggest success. So if you can take care of your family, relatives, that is big enough. And, and actually I believe that that's the highest form of success because if your family and those that you love are not a bother to a country like Kenya, it means that now the funds that could have been using for social support, uh, probably we use them to build roads and only help those who are really in extreme situations. So that is my challenge to all the Muslims who are on board that let's look inside, let's build ourselves and uh, Kenya and the world will become a better place. And thank you, uh, Omar, and uh, Wahid, Haitam, and the other panelists who are on board for the opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. Um, Mr. Roba, are you back on air? Can you hear us? I can hear you, can you hear me? Shukran, yes, we can. Please, Karim. Inshallah, we can we can continue with the brother Ro Ronyangiri while we wait for Mr. Roba. Inshallah, no problem. Thank you. Thanks, brother Omar. Uh, hi, Tham. I, I will beg to differ. On my side, I'm very good with tech and finance. <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. 
so no one is going to suffer. Uh, I don't know how we're going to do this, but uh, I think I can just give an intro uh, about Ndovu, who we are, uh, what we do, and, and how we dovetail uh, with Wahed and this particular offering. Uh, so off the top, Ndovu is uh, the first regulated robo-advisor on the African continent uh, that gives everyone easy access uh, to global financial markets. On our platform, we do have uh, the conventional offering, but we also have uh, the Sharia compliant offering, which is actually what you're talking about today. Uh, Ndovu was formed in 2020. The vision behind the company really was to provide everyone on the African continent with easy access uh, to financial markets, to provide opportunities that are, are very affordable uh, to everyone along the, uh, the, the, the social line. And then finally, to provide education. Uh, we all know that uh, the levels of financial literacy, financial education on the African continent as a whole are quite low. So we created this simple integrated platform uh, to tackle a problem that exists in every single household, exists in every uh, single institution. And this is where we borrowed the term, uh, the elephant in the room. So from elephant in the room is the inspiration uh, that formed the name of the company, which is uh, Ndovu. So the fund we're talking about today, the, the Halal Fund, uh, the technical uh, ticker name is HLAL, as, as Haitham mentioned, uh, but we've simplified this. We know how difficult it is for, uh, your day-to-day -day individual to, talk, to know about financial products. So we've sort of repackaged uh, this particular fund and simply call it halal for, for ease of understanding uh, by everyone and ease of access uh, on the platform. So what Ndovu does, we provide a simple online platform where individuals come online, they get profile by profiling. I mean, they get to determine uh, whether there are a conservative investor, whether they're balanced investor or aggressive investor, this depends on their risk appetite. And then we match them uh, to a portfolio that uh, is sort of congruent to, to their risk profile. Today's focus on the Halal Fund is something that is very, very dear to my heart. For many years, uh, Omar mentioned that I've been in financial services for nearly two decades now. For, for many, many years, uh, especially when I was on the wealth management side, we most of the assets that we actually got access to were full of riba. They're all haram uh, assets, but their very nature, uh, not but by their very nature, they actually excluded a huge chunk uh, of the populace. So if we think about Kenya alone, where we are about 10 to 15 percent of the population uh, being Muslim, uh, we can see that millions are actually excluded. Uh, from opportunities uh, to invest and grow wealth that uh, is in line with their faith. The problem gets more pervasive when you go beyond Kenya, when you, when you think about our brothers in Tanzania, you're thinking about folks down in Mozambique, uh, think about West Africa. So Ndovu's mission really is to use technology uh, to educate more and more people on the African continent, and then also use technology to enable people to easily invest uh, into the Halal Fund. Now, there are over 8,000 uh, possible funds that we could have used uh, to, to, to allow the UMA to invest. We did our due diligence as a business, as Ndovu, and we ended up with Wahed because we love their mission, we love the team that is be behind the company, and we also love the fact that Wahed has spread its wings across multiple jurisdictions. Getting approved by regulators in the US, the UK, Malaysia is a deep vote of confidence in the kind of business uh, that Junaid Haitham and the rest of the team have built right now and the future of the business. So right now we are offering the Halal Fund uh, on Dovu, but we're also looking at onboarding the UMA Fund as well. Uh, because as uh, Haitham mentioned at the very start of his presentation, is then the, the halal fund is focused on the US, but there are investment opportunities outside the US as well. So we're talking about South Korea, talking about Japan, through this second fund that will be onboarding uh, in a few weeks, will also extend the opportunity to all of you. So in, in case you want to diversify, 
uh, your holdings. You simply don't want to be exposed to the American market. Uh, you love what you're seeing out of Asia. The second fund uh, will also give you a Sharia compliant opportunity to, to get your money to work for you. I don't know if you had a specific question, Omar, but I've sort of uh, captured Novu's role and our push for, for this particular fund. Um, that was very brief. Um, a question like, how much do I need to invest the minimum? Thanks, Omar. Uh, the minimum amount for investing is 5,050. Go ahead, Omar. Uh, is it open to Muslims only? or non-Muslims can join? Ah, people. fantastic question. Ah, okay, okay. Lovely, lovely question. So the fund is open to, to everyone, uh, both Muslims and non-Muslims. And this goes back to uh, what Brother Haitam mentioned in that the, the funds have an element of ESG, that's environmental social responsibility, as well as uh, governance responsibility in terms of how our business is is run. So everyone out there, uh, a business that is doing uh, well uh, in, in, on earth or in the community, uh, this particular fund is very, very suitable for you. So in a nutshell, this fund is not restricted to Muslims. It is open to everyone who is looking to invest along ethical lines. The minimum investment into, into the fund is uh, 5,050 shillings. Uh, we've made it uh, affordable. Remember, a core tenet of Ndovu is making investments affordable to, to everyone. Um, a question for the panelists. Sorry, if, I can, if I can add just a quick uh, note to Rose's uh, discussion on, um, you know, a lot of people think this is only for, for Muslims. Uh, when I joined Amana Funds um, um, it, in 2016, 80% of the fund, the five, four billion that we managed at the time was from non-Muslims. So that tells you something. They're not with us because they're, we're Islamic or they're Islamic. They're with us because of the performance. And so this is another thing to think about: is that you know, look at you know, look at the prospectus, look at the one, three, five, you know, uh, ten-year performance. If there's record that long on the funds, and that should give you you know a good indication um, on how the funds do relative to the general market. But again, it's not apples to apples when you want to compare because if banks do well. Uh, in certain time periods, um, you know, where the funds are not, the Islamic funds are not going to do well because they're not uh, involved in that. But just like the financial crisis in 2008, uh, it was a financial crisis, which means any banks or insurance or any highly debted companies or companies with a lot of debt, which we don't own because of the parameters that um, uh, our brother Sheikh mentioned earlier, um, you know, we didn't fall as bad as the market did. So that just keep that in line when you're thinking about this as relatively to the overall market. Uh, Brother Ro, a question for the panelists. I think now this is meant for you, Brother Ro. Um, what's the ROI on your, when I invest with you? Okay, fantastic question. That is uh, typically Kenyan. We, we get that with every single uh, sort of investment. Uh, the thing is this, we, as investment professionals, we, we cannot sit down and just tell you that the ROI is this going forward because that's a promise that is unrealistic. But what I can give you as a guidance is the performance that this particular fund has given since its uh, inception. Uh, Brother Haitha mentioned this, it was about 71%, I think, uh, to date. So total, yeah, total, yeah. total return since inception is 71 and a half percent versus the S&P, uh, the market was about 57%. Exactly. And so this means if you had put in 10,000 shillings, your fund has grown by 7,000 bob and some. So that, that is a good guide uh, in terms of the question around ROI to date. Thank you, Brother Ro. I think uh, Mr. Roba is back on air. And uh, okay. we can... Mr. Mr. Roba, tafaddal. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I was saying apologies. Uh, I had to check in late because of uh, some other issues. Actually, Omar called me, called me when I was just checking into hotel. 
Uh, so for Haidam, the comment he made about uh, finance people not being very good in uh, IT, uh, I think it was misplaced. Challenges are there because, uh, like I said, I was traveling. Anyway, I'll just move on to what I've been given to tackle, the issue of uh, uh, investments. I think some of the questions are actually overtaken by events because uh, Omar asked me to define actual office investment and also uh, the objectives of, uh, of people investing. So basically, when you talk about investment in, a, in very simple terms, it is just a process of investing your money so that you can get a return on it. So this is a very simple definition, but the question is, why are people investing? You investing today is actually for going consumption. The money you have, to, instead of consuming it today, or the resources that are available to you, instead of consuming it, you actually decide to put it in investment so that either you grow your wealth, your incomes, people do it for retirement planning, and also if you have any financial goals, investment helps you achieve those goals. In a nutshell, it is basically for going the current consumption so that in future, you are able to derive some benefits from that investment that you made today, and that's investment. Now, in terms of funds, and I think uh, some panelists have already talked about funds. Uh, funds, uh, funds uh, is basically pulling of resources. So sometimes, again, as individuals, we have limitations in terms of what we have. So instead of you struggling as an individual, you decide to come together and pull funds, and you actually use the pool, the funds that you pulled to invest. And that is very, a very basic uh, definition of what a fund is. So I, I, the challenge with funds, and, and more specifically, I'll talk about Kenya one, is uh, the issue of uh, are the funds that are there uh, Sharia compliant. We talked about the issues of screening in terms of portfolios in which these funds should be invested. We talked about the issues of uh, uh, ECG, the, the, the Environment, Social Governance, ETC. But, but the question is, uh, are these funds Sharia compliant? That is one challenge. And why do I talk about that one? There is a very big misconception already in the market in terms of uh, the admissibility of the existing uh, Sharia uh, offering in the market in terms of both Islamic banking insurance, the Islamic funds that are available in the market and ETC. So the market has already that misconception about actually existing Sharia compliant. We are having that challenge. So whereas we might have not even have uh, investment avenues available in both the money and capital markets, I think even as we try to think about uh, putting in place appropriate uh, investment avenues or tools for people to invest in, we must again uh, look at the issues underlying uh, the misconception about the Sharia uh, investments and maybe Sharia uh, structures that we have in Kenya. Uh, the other bit that I, I want to talk about is access to financing. So far, even in the conventional markets, our people are not able to access financing. Uh, a lot of financial institutions, when you go to, they're asking for collaterals or security for you to access financing. So again, uh, funds will help in terms of people pulling resources. But in terms of access to form formal financing, we still have the majority of Muslims not being able to actually access formal financing. Most of them could be having bank accounts, but access to financing is still a limitation. So the question is, how are these Islamic financial institutions, uh, uh, how do, will they help people actually uh, access financing? Because again, you cannot separate the component of uh, financing vis-a-vis -vis that one of uh, investing. The other issue I'll talk about is maybe FinTech space. Uh, we've seen Gulf African Bank and uh, Safari Bomb uh, issuing, uh, there is a product they have actually put in the market. And, and actually, we, we can't actually ignore the, 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 the role of FinTech in terms of uh, Islamic investing and uh, what, uh, as much as Islamic finance is concerned. But the question is, again, uh, what does FinTech portend for uh, Muslims in Kenya, more so, given the misconception already about the existing structures, and now we introduce FinTech into the market, uh, which will compete with other conventional products in the FinTech space. Now, in terms of options available uh, for investment, uh, we have circles uh, that are Sharia compliant today. Circles are very good tools for uh, mobilizing investments, but also they can help you financing uh, perhaps in terms of your, facility, uh, of, of your, of your savings uh, for investment purposes. Uh, we have also banks that are fully fledged and we have windows. We have now Islamic institutions actually doing real estate projects in terms of uh, real uh, estate investment trusts that are Islamic or Sharia compliant. Nothing much in the market yet, but these are also uh, avenues that people can use to invest. For stocks, it has been talked about in terms of screening and, and what is admissible. We also have blood fund AMAL, which, in the, which is in the pensions market. So again, if you want to invest in the long term, uh, 
uh, Muslims uh, or non-Muslims who are interested in Sharia investing can invest in, in pension funds, Sharia compliant, and I've just given an example of the last fund amount. Then you have collective investment teams, uh, Apollo Asset Management Sharia compliant fund, and if you see, basically these are money market funds, they are, they are the investment of uh, avenues available in, in the short term. Uh, another note uh, I want to put across, not about investments, but basically other issues. We have, we have had Kuruitu at NAC in the past. This is an Islamic fund that was listed uh, uh, in the alternative, uh, or, or rather, the, 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 the growing segment of the market at the NAC. But these funds have also faced challenges. So whereas we've talked about indices, I think Haidam introduced something about uh, indices. Uh, the other panelists have also talked about such things. I think the issues of uh, indices look too technical for people. Uh, in simple terms, I, I think they'll just want uh, solutions in terms of what is Sharia investing and, 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 and actually where they can they invest. You know, when we go to talk about indices, we, are, we, we even have Dow Jones, we have S&P 500, and, and some of these funds are already have Islamic indices. But the question is, again, back to the same, same misconception problems. Uh, really, when you go by this, uh, these indices, are they guiding you enough? Uh, then the other, the other issue of ROI, 71% uh, uh, that you indicated, I think uh, that ROI basically, uh, I don't know the investment tool to using to, to, to uh, get uh, that, that kind of ROI, and I don't know the benchmark that you're using to test again uh, whether you are doing better than the benchmark or otherwise. Uh, but in conventional finance and actually dictates, I think 71% uh, for, uh, for a very short period of time is quite a, a, a huge ROI. So. I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roba. Um, a question to Haitham or Sheikh Badru. Now, as an investor, I'm told I'll get, let's say, three, four, five percent. Whatever that I'm getting back, is it not riba? Ama, what is riba for a layman? Or how do I ensure that my investment is not touched by riba? Shukran. Ro, do you want to take that first? Okay. Uh, Salam alaikum. Um, when when you invest with a company, and uh, this company, uh, we all know that uh, it, it it runs a business that is Sharia compliant, then uh, you can't really say uh, there's riba in it. And for us to say there, there is riba, uh, the definition of riba, of course, has uh, to be understood. Um, if you have given a loan and you get uh, an amount, you know, over and above that amount that you advance, then would say that is uh, interest. Uh, so that that is one way of looking at it. And then secondly. If uh, this company, as we have already indicated, um, is not dealing in riba, and if there is, for example, um, there's some uh, interest uh, bearing uh, loan that they have taken or even given out, and during the process of paying you um, that return, there's purification that has already taken place, then we wouldn't, wouldn't even be talking of uh, interest. Um, uh, and, uh, and therefore, if we are talking of an investment, you can't really say uh, there's interest in it if you're talking about an investment. And here, um, probably I'm uh, purely referring to uh, investment from a Sharia point of view, meaning that when you give a loan from a Sharia point of view, that is not investing. It is not referred to as investing, okay? Uh, so if you have injected your money in a company, you expect that company to make profits as well as there is a likelihood of it incurring a losses. So anything that you get above the amount that you invested with that company would be deemed to be a profit, of course, after they have done uh, their computations and what have you. So in a, in a, in a, in a very uh, simple way, uh, in a very simple way is that if uh, we have a Sharia board in place or Sharia screening in place, then we can't really be talking of interest in uh, the money that you have received. 
I think I'll just leave it at that. Zakala uh, khair. Um, let me just add to that. So, on top of the, um, you know, the qualitative and quantitative filters, financial ratios that we go through, we also have a purification method uh, every year that we go through, especially at Wahid, uh, to make sure that any of this interest income that comes in is also purified based on number of shares you own in the in the in the fund and how long you've owned it and so forth. Um, because if you put a 0% interest filter, I don't want to buy companies that either have loans or, uh, or, or borrow or get interest. There's probably only like uh, less than uh, 10 companies publicly traded, and I emphasize publicly traded companies that you can invest in in this global market. Because just the qualitative filters and the quantitative filters alone wipes out 50% of the publicly traded companies. Now, you can obviously go and buy a mom and pop butcher's halal shop because you know that you know the knife is not being used on any pork product or anything haram is coming into that uh, to that place of business. Uh, but when we talk about publicly traded companies, and again, I'm not a scholar here. I'm just telling you what I know from a financial lens. Uh, we go with the scholarly advice, and then we make sure that we we invest in those companies. And let me give you two examples. Um, Amazon, you know, you know where Amazon value is today. At at some point, they did not sell alcohol, right? And Amazon bought wine.com, uh, I think a couple of years ago. And so even though it's less than 5%, so they're earning less than 5% from of their revenue from alcohol sales, because Amazon is in the product business, they um, alcohol is one of their product, it automatically filters out. We can, we, you cannot invest in it from an Islamic perspective. On the flip side, and we have to get rid of it in the portfolio, in the, in the flip side, uh, you know, Apple is is in the indice or in the fund, and um, Apple has billions of money sitting in, in in accounts earning interest because they make so much money. Now, when you look at the company, again, it's it's the minority does not affect the majority or doesn't change the character of the company. So, uh, Apple is not a financial services intermediary uh, business using using you know other people's money to make money. Right, they're a technology company. They have a lot of cash. They earn interest. Now, when you have a thousand uh, uh, people standing in lines for thousand dollar phones, or now today they're like two thousand dollar phones, every quarter they make so much revenue from their actual core business that the the uh, the secondary form of income, this interest that's coming into their bank account, is less than five percent. So it's it's permissible, but at top of that, there is purification on that as well. So hopefully that answers your question. And again, I apologize uh, to uh, Brother Roba and, and, and the other panelists. When I meant about technology, I meant about myself. You can see I, was, I had a nice presentation to show you today, but unfortunately it's not working. So again, I, I apologize. And I know you guys are more tech savvy and financial savvy than I am. So um, with that, I think there's some other open questions. Uh, Omar, if you, wanna, yes, you want us to address it or um, how do you want to do it? Yes, please. Um, in case a company becomes non-Sharia compliant, how fast is it removed from the halal portfolio? I think this is meant for Ndovu. And then second question, do you have, uh, this is now for Wahid, do you have different portfolios for different regions or continents? Um, a third question for Brother Haitham, do you check or follow up on Ndovu to make sure they remain halal every month, quarterly, yearly? How do you do it? Shukran. Uh, yeah, Ro, once you start and then I can, yeah. Yeah. So the, the questions are sort of convoluted there. Uh, the, the understanding has been reversed, especially the last one. Uh, in that Ndovu, the way it works is Ndovu, we are the investment platform that faces a client here in Africa. So a client will pay via M-Pesa card or bank transfer. And then we in we we buy a portion of the wirehead fund on the on the other side. So the uh sort of Policing, the, the watching the Sharia compliance is done in reverse. It's Novo actually looking at Wahed. We actually look at what are their holdings. And this is based on the reports that they provide to uh, the regulator in the United States. This is on a regular basis. This is what we look at. And in case we see anything weird, Haitham is here that we can talk to him directly. And this is sort of check that, that we do on our end. But for Wahed themselves, they do have a Sharia board. Uh, don't forget that there's a Sharia board. 
uh, that they report to uh, every single month, every single quarter. And then as Haitha mentioned as well, their fund, uh, it's especially the halal fund that you're talking about today, uh, it's, it's what we call a passive fund. It tracks an index, the USA Sharia uh, index. So if there's any change within that particular index, it will be reflected in Warhead. So there are multiple checks that actually uh, occur on a regular basis by different parties. Uh, there was a first question I think I missed, uh, Brother Omar. I didn't capture that. There was one, uh, if you can remind me, the first one. Okay. I believe I believe it was related if, if Wahid has different portfolios for different uh, parts yes. of the world. Yeah, we we no, it's uh, one it's it's uh, the the in the the in the 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 ETF the exchange traded fund that we we uh, provide or 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 create is is throughout it's global. Um so it's not different for anybody um on their particular region. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, so, so whether you're in Kenya or you're sitting in Mozambique or you're sitting in Saudi, you're gonna get access to the same fund. Uh, this is a beauty about Wahed, what Wahed has actually done here. They've scoured the globe, come up with a unique portfolio that anyone in the Ummah can actually invest in. And just to give you some background, uh, we have three independent Sharia board advisors, uh, Sheikh uh, Dr. Az uh, Adnan Hassan, um, he's a member of Sharia Council of Ayofi, as I mentioned to you. We have Mufti Faraz Adam uh, Hanif from uh, Sh uh, Sharia Advisor uh, based in the UK. And we have Sheikh Muhammad Ahmed Sultan. Uh, so three different independent um, uh, uh, views and uh, compliance reviews on top of the actual indice that itself that's being uh, Sharia compliant in the first place uh, through um, their own uh, Sharia boards as well. Uh, Brother Haytham, a question that came, how fast do you remove an uncompliant, um, what is it? How fast is an uncompliant company removed from the halal portfolio? What's your uh, real yeah. Great question. I mean, um, we, we monitor it uh, on a monthly basis. I mean, you know, um, there, is, there is sometimes, you know, in, in public companies, as you all know, there is mergers and acquisitions. Um, I'll give you a classic example. Uh, one time, and this is uh, in, in, in another firm I used to work with. Uh, you know, we had a fund that uh, mimicked Amazon in Latin America. And, you know, I was giving a presentation to a masjid board and one of the person happened to be, uh, works for Amazon. He said, oh, is this the same thing as why you took Amazon because now they sell alcohol. And I said, you know, as of today, I don't know that they sell alcohol. So I went to the hotel I researched the company. I put, you know, um, uh, stuff for a lot of beer, and nothing came up. Just glass and and nothing. No, no actual liquid. Then I was just searching more. I put whiskey, and there was a bottle of of whiskey. So immediately, I sent to the investment committee, and I said, "Hey, uh, we need to look at this. It seems like now these guys are doing the same thing as Amazon." And within a week, uh, we got rid of it. Now. Uh, sometimes, you know, there is uh, there is strategies on, on getting rid of it because, you know, uh, there is capital gains. If it's a taxable account, this may not be, um, uh, you know, relevant to you guys. But in the U.S., for example, you know, uh, they're, 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 you have to sell it in tranches. So there's not a big hit from a tax or capital gains perspective. But the the intention is to get rid of it as soon as possible and as strategically as as, as capable as we can. Shukran. Um, another question. The halal fund for the last month or so has declined in profits, yes. negative 6.4% as of this week. Yes. Um, what's the issue? Should an investor be worried? Okay. Uh, fantastic question. And uh, I, I, I believe Ro can also answer this. But, you know, typically, obviously, the market is down. Everything is down. Um, this is, you know, something I tell people to, to think about. I mean, you know, the best investors, the Warren Buffetts and the Carl Icahns of the world actually uh, view these times as uh, discounts. And this is the only place uh, or only product, if you will, in the market that when there's a discount, nobody wants to go into it. So uh, one, it's a, it's, a, it's a great opportunity. No one has the answer. If anyone tells you exactly, it's not timing the market, it's more time in the market. Um, but if you, if you think about it, um, you know, the market has been down. Obviously, the, the, the funds have been down as well. Uh, but I tell people, 
this is uh, looking at the market now is as if you're looking at it from a laptop view. You're only seeing a very small portion of the market. Now, there is bull markets and bear markets. Uh, bull, they reference bull because they have horns. It's up markets, you know, market swings upward. Bear markets with the claw coming down, it's down market. The frequency of bull markets throughout the history of, of the market itself is they're more frequent uh, to have bull markets than bear markets. And bear markets, the duration of bear markets is, is less. So when I tell people the analogy is that, hey, when you're looking at the computer view, you're looking at it as a down market, but it, really how you should see investments is a long-term investment view. And that's our philosophy at Wahid is to see it as a long-term view. You should be sitting at the back of the theater and look at it. And when you see that, and you see where you were looking at it, you were just looking at a small piece of what typically a long-term uh, view or return on investment markets are. And again, historical performance, not indicative of future, but yes, the market is down, the funds are down, we're not as down as much as the markets because of the obvious reasons I, I, I mentioned before. Um, and uh, you know, uh, again, I, I think the market is down 15.6%, uh, year to date, the funds about 13%. So. Again, um, it's, it's, it's just what is your goal of the money and what is your time horizon? And if someone tells me, hey, I have a one to two year goal, I, 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 you know, I don't know what's going to happen in the market. I say either don't invest or put it more conservative. But if your term is more three to five years to have your money grow and to beat inflation and, 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 and have more purchasing power, then that's how you should be looking at investments. And Ro can add to that. Shukran. Yeah, absolutely, um, brother Haitham. I, I mean, markets, me move, markets move up and down. Sorry, Omar, go ahead. Thank you. Um, someone is asking, uh, since you use Wahed account for the halal investments, do you separate funds collected from halal investors from the funds collected from other groups of investors on your platform? As for different groups of investors you have on your platform, are the funds separated? Thank you. Okay. So there are two questions, one question, plus let me finish the other one. So I, I completely agree with what uh, Brother Haitham mentioned. Uh, markets move up and down. That, that is their very nature, okay? What is super important here is the horizon that you're looking at. If you're looking at a three, five year uh, time period, this is a blip, it's a sneeze. It, it, it's something really tiny, you know? You should not be worried about this uh, when your horizon is uh, along those lines of three to five. Uh, if you're looking at something shorter, then probably you're not meant to be in equities in the first place. You should be looking at something else. Um, on the second question, so the way the way our platform works is we use what are called pass-through accounts. So a pass-through account is where money is received. So you pay, it goes into an account, and then it moves out. Okay. So this particular account, no riba, uh, no opportunity of even earning anything. All right. So when folks pay, whether it's uh, you're, you're, you're trying to, to, to invest in the US uh, S&P 500, or in this case, you wanna invest in the halal fund, at the initial point, the money is gonna flow into the same account because it's what we call a collection account, but then it's going to flow out immediately uh, to be used to purchase uh, the various assets. So the segregation happens at the asset level. So segregation here is keeping the assets apart. So there will be folks who will be in, invested purely in the halal fund uh, via Wirehead. The other guys on another side will be invested purely in the S&P 500. So that, that separation does occur the way we run the business. Shukran, uh, Brother Ro. There's a question from one of our um, attendants. Uh, hello, please advise on tax. I'm not sure. Um, the kind of tax she's asking about, but I guess if she can hear me, she can send us uh, her question again. Thank you. Um, Brother Roba, you had a question for the panelists, please. Um, you can give Mr. Roba the mic, please. Thank you. you can hear me yes i can bismillah yeah 
Yeah, so I'll uh, my fellow panelists. I'm just asking questions for the benefit of everyone here. Uh, perhaps I don't know if the entire audience also has uh, a uh, much knowledge in finance, but I have just have some few questions. Because I could be interested in, uh, in what, you, what you're doing. Uh, the first question is uh, who regulates Ndovo and also who regulates Tawahid? Uh, uh, I'm asking that these questions because uh, the, the, the exchange traded funds, uh, the, the collective investment schemes, and every other investment uh, tool available in Kenya is actually regulated by the, uh, uh, the, the Capital Markets Authority of Kenya. Uh, and these firms or these funds usually undergo through very stringent requirements in terms of uh, meeting what the regulator requires. And, uh, and perhaps this is very important to safeguard the public funds. So the question is for Wahid and Dobu, uh, who are the regulators uh, respectively? And then uh, number two, uh, the, the issue of performance and performance attribution uh, from the portfolio. Uh, there is a question that, that you answered actually in terms of uh, uh, some, some returns uh, being negative uh, in the last month or something like that. So uh, in terms of safeguarding again investors from, from, from the losses and actually if you're looking at a portfolio that is well balanced, we should be able to, yes, the world could be not be doing very well at the moment in terms of the entire uh, market, uh, markets, financial markets. But the question is, again, what is the constitution of your portfolio to ensure that, uh, uh, you know, we're able to safeguard investors from, uh, you know, losses? And also in terms of benchmarking, uh, uh, you know, the benchmarking also has its own issues. So the question is, uh, how do you choose uh, your indices in terms of what you want to benchmark against? Does it have the same characteristics as actually your fund? Uh, that's the question I'm asking. And then uh, in terms of your fees, are they front end, are they back end? Basically, are you a fund manager? If you're a fund manager, how are you charging your fees? Because actually the, the portfolio is being managed by a wide, then what does Lobo do exactly? And how do you charge your fees? Or how do you benefit from it? Thank you. Of course. Um, okay. So brother, there are a number of questions there. Yes, Brother Omar. Uh, go, go on, please. Go on, please. Yeah, so a bunch of questions uh, that uh, Brother Roba has put together. Uh, so one, we Novo is regulated by the Capital Markets Authority here in Kenya. We're also getting our licenses in a couple of more African countries. Uh, Wahed is regulated by the SEC in the US, the FCA in the UK, and also the uh, security regulator in Malaysia. Uh, I will jump the next two questions. They're more Wahed focused uh, because there are issues about indices in there. And I'll, I'll tackle the last one. Uh, which is the fees. So Ndovu is an investment advisor. We are a licensed investment advisor. What we actually do is uh, one, provide uh, investors with some knowledge about financial markets. That's the education side of things. Two, using our digital platform, we provide easy access. You can use mobile money now to invest in the Wahed Fund, for example, to buy a share of it. This is something you could not do before. Uh, so the mix between the advice that we provide and the access actually allows us to charge a fee uh, for our service. So we charge, there are two charge structures for us. Uh, one is a basic plan where someone pays 1% of the assets uh, that they invest. And then there is what we call a premium plan, which is 0.75%. Uh, this is for individuals who invest over a thousand US uh, or Kenya shilling uh, equivalent. I think I will pass the next, the, the two questions in between to Haitham. Yeah, thank you, um, Rowan. Thank you, uh, Brother Robert, for the question. So in regards to, um, uh, you mentioned a comment about, you know, how do you guarantee um, investors from a loss or how does indices? Well, as we all know, you know, taking investment takes some risk, right? Um, you, you have an option. You can, one, put it in, in behind the, the, the pillow and, 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 you know, it won't grow as far as inflation. Uh, so in order for the money to grow, um, you can invest it on your own where you go out and select the funds and you have to, you know, if you're looking from Sharia compliant, make sure the company is Sharia compliant and monitor it and, and so forth. And just to give you a personal example, I have the licensing and all the credentials to run my own portfolio if I wanted to. 
I travel so much that I don't even have time. So I put it in the funds myself um, and so forth. Now, regards as far as, you know, picking the indices, um, you know, in the US, there was no Sharia ETF. There's mutual funds. And so, you know, the mutual fund managers at Amana and others in the US, the way they work is a portfolio manager based on the screening that we talked about, the qualitative and qualitative screening. Let's say there's 300 out of the 10,000 stocks you can buy publicly traded. There's, you know, 300 that are fit both qualitative and quantitative. And if you put the ESG lens, it's even more. And so that portfolio manager in a fund management perspective selects 30 or 40 stocks that they like and they feel is related to the objective of the fund. And that's how the fund, a mutual fund works. The, the ETF side, which we at Wahid focus on, is an exchange traded fund. So there's still a portfolio manager. And what the portfolio manager is selecting an indice to, 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 to benchmark or index to. And there's a lot of Sharia compliant indices. There is the Dow Jones, there is the FTSE, there is the uh, Russell 1000, you name it. So they're picking what markets they wanna mimic to. And so why we chose FTSE, for example, US, uh, uh, US FTSE is it gives us, um, after the filtration, it gives us an exposure to a very well diversified uh, group of companies, 236 companies uh, to, currently in the indices that are Sharia compliant. Um, and the, as I mentioned, 85 percent is large cap and 15 percent is mid cap. And these are, you know, your, you know, um, your apples, your Googles, your uh, pharmaceuticals, Pfizer and so forth that are compliant, you know, with the Sharia compliance. And so uh, it gives a, a, a more diversification as far as, you know, different sectors and different uh, companies um, that uh, mimic the market as a whole, but in a Sharia compliant lens. So hopefully. Uh, that answers your, your, your question. Shukran, Brother Haitham. Um, I think a question that I can give to Brother Robert. Brother Robert, um, in, a question in regards to income tax, is there a percentage uh, paid on the income and is it considered as other income while filing for the individual return? If there is a tax, is it final tax? Thank you. Or any panelist can uh, help me answer that uh, role. I think Robert has gone on uh, his dinner break. Okay. So the first and foremost disclaimer, we are not tax advisors. I don't think there's a tax advisor on this panel tonight. Uh, but whoever has asked the question, I actually welcome you to, to reach out to me personally to, to go over this, because what you're running into is an aspect of two jurisdictions. Uh, the U.S. on its side will not levy, uh, say, capital gains tax on you or income tax because you're a non-resident. Uh, but then on this side, if, if, you, if you sell the ETF and say you make money uh, off it as a profit, you make a capital gain, uh, capital gains taxes were suspended on marketable securities. So marketable securities are your ETFs, bonds, uh, shares all suspended in uh, 2017. On the other aspect of whether you declare it as other income, I cannot give you a definitive answer right now. That is something we can take, we can definitely take offline because some clarity is needed. Uh, from a U.S. perspective, ETFs in general compared to mutual funds, if they're in a taxable account, let's say, and I don't know what the tax laws are in Africa, um, they uh, mutual funds, if there's any dividends uh, that are paid out or reinvested in the fund, or there's a capital gains to the fund, like say, you know, the Amazon we found out has alcohol, the portfolio manager has to get rid of it in the portfolio, well, that will have a capital gains if a taxable account. And, and when you actually physically sell the mutual fund, you will also have either capital gains or capital loss, depending on short term, long term. In the ETF world, uh, and again, I'm not sure as it relates to Africa, but in a taxable account in the US, for example, ETFs don't have, that's the benefit of having ETFs is that they don't have this um, as you're holding it, any capital gains or any um, dividend taxes. The only taxes you pay is when you actually execute a sale of it and there's a gain on that. So hopefully that helps. Shukran, Brother Haitham. Um, we can take um, a minute each 
from our panelists, you give your uh, concluding remarks, and then we can call it a night, inshallah. We can start with you, Brother Haitham. Okay, well, uh, first of all, uh, to Ndovo, Ro, and the panelists, and you, Brother Omar, for hosting and moderating. You did a beautiful job, mashallah, and to our guests. Uh, you know, uh, you we are here to help you answer your questions. So please reach out to Brother Ro and the panelists if you have any specific questions. And if I have to get involved, we partner with Ndovo um, and you know, we, can, we can help in that discussion. Uh, basically, uh, you know, you know, investments, uh, think of it as long-term. Uh, don't try to time the market. You know, um, it's time in the market. And, and historically, this has been proven the fact that people who have stayed in the market um, have always had typically the, the, the uh, the um, highest return or performance on their on their overall portfolio. When emotions come into the play, this is where we get fearful and stuff, and we might have to, you know, uh, do some things that, you know, I just had a conversation with a client the other day, and he goes, well, you know, I'm fearful about the market. I have this. I bought it at 50. Now it's at 40. Uh, what do you think if I sell it at 40 and then go back to it, uh, you know, when it goes back up? And I go, well, does that make sense? Does that make sense that you take a loss on it and then you only want to go back in it and buy it at a higher price, right? But if you stick to it in the long term and that's your goal, then inshallah, you know, and Allah is the best uh, giving of risk and only Allah knows best what's going to happen in the future. But you keep that to, to Allah and, and, and you make uh, salah and, 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 and dua, inshallah, everything will, will come your um, way. Brother Haytham, there's a question, if you don't mind, eh? one last question from our panelists, uh, from our attendants. Um, Wahid Haitham, on yeah. the Novo Halal portfolio, which are the ETFs? All I have seen are just companies. I think that's better for Ro to answer, yeah. Yeah, let, let me tackle that. So all of them are ETFs, whatever the uh, individual asked the question, uh, if you're still on, the all of them are actually ETFs. So what we've done, when you click on the ETF, we display to you which companies are within that ETF, all right? So if you go on the halal one, for example, you click on it, uh, you will see Tesla, you will see Apple in there, you'll see Johnson & Johnson. So it's really information share. It's a transparency bit that we're giving when you click on that. I, I hope that has answered your question. Thank you. I guess uh, uh, the answer is clear. Um, your concluding remarks, Brother Ro, then we go to Mr. Roba. Yes, absolutely. So first and foremost, thank you, Brother Omar, for moderating. And thank you, everyone, for giving us one and a half hours of your time uh, this evening. You could be relaxed, but you're here to, you're listening to us uh, blabber on and on about finance and, and, and markets. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to Hytham for waking up really early to join us today. <laughs> this is many one of many days where we'll wake you up. Uh, thanks, Robert, for making it, uh, despite all the challenges around travel and tech. Uh, Robert, as always, it's great to interact with you. Uh, Sheikh Jafar, uh, just a random story. I think when the Sheikh was in Markfield in Leicestershire, uh, at the same time, I was living in, in North Wales. At that time, I was actually looking at what Markfield was doing around Islamic finance. So just a random story on the side. Uh, we are doing something that is will be considered groundbreaking in east africa uh, but it's the norm in many other countries in the world and this is about uh, empowering individuals to to build wealth uh, through diligent informed investing uh, we know it's early days we know people have tons of information uh, please don't feel shy please reach out uh, the, the there's a support email on the ndovu website ndovu.co uh, please reach out. Uh, those of you in attendance who have personal connections with panelists tonight, please reach out. Uh, the idea here is to not only build wealth, but also build knowledge around investing and improving lives uh, for everyone in the Ummah. Thank you so much and have a lovely evening, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Ro. Mr. Roba, please. Hello, Mr. Roba, can you hear me? Yeah, 
Okay, I'm Yomar. Uh, your concluding remarks, Shukran. Yes, I'm saying my comments are very few. Uh, thank you, Omar. Thank you, Robert, for convening this. My challenge to you, Omar and, uh, and Robert, maybe you can organize typical forums. The reason I'm saying this, people have, need a lot of financial literacy. Uh, you know, like uh, Arrow said, the forum is not just for in investing, but also knowledge. So yeah, we need uh, a lot of knowledge in, uh, into our people in terms of investing. So sometimes I think physical forums will also work. So I'm just challenging you. Can you organize more physical forums so that we're able to educate our people on investment options available? And actually the, the direction uh, they can take in terms of investing. Uh, the other aspect, uh, I'll also want to challenge everyone else in terms of our own Islamic financial markets development within the country. I know and, and Dobo could be an option, uh, Wahid could be an option, but again, we need to develop our market so that we also have a range of investment options available. And that's a challenge at the moment. Uh, and like I said, for Sheikh uh, Badru and the rest, we still have a lot of uh, complication in the market in terms of what people believe, is be what the market uh, offers, both in terms of banking, insurance, and also investing. So that cannot be, there the can be no short term solution to that. Of course, it's long term, I know it's a big challenge. But through such physical forums that I'm asking Omar and uh, maybe Robert to organize, then we should be able to uh, pass information properly in terms of uh, what is available and what, what you believe is actually should I compliant so that people get the uh, information. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Robert. Robert Chien, can you hear me? Um, your concluding remarks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Omar, uh, for the opportunity. So, first of all, I want to thank all our panelists. I want to thank uh, Hetan, uh, Sheikh uh, Badru, uh, Roba, uh, for giving us uh, investing from an Islamic finance point of view. And also want to thank Ro and Dovu for hosting us uh, tonight. Uh, also Alex uh, working behind the scenes. So there's a lot that has gone on behind the scenes. And I also want to specifically thank the Abojani community members who are here who helped us to push and reach to other uh, Muslim community. And I believe uh, like Roba has challenged us, this is just the beginning. So let's keep learning. So investing is a journey. So I always say that not a transaction. So let's keep with that spirit. And that will be the differentiating factor for us. And uh, for me as Robert Chieng, the only thing that can make me happy is if you are at the dinner table with your family and people are happy. So I believe investing can contribute to that. That is the biggest form of success in my small world. And I hope that as many people can buy that idea. So let's grow together, uh, keep learning and uh, work to make Kenya good and the world as well. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, Sheikh Badru Jafar, your concluding remarks. Uh, thank you, Brother Omar, and uh, thank you, my fellow panelists. Um, I think the most important things uh, have been mentioned, and uh, more specifically by uh, Mr. Roba, uh, that uh, definitely we need uh, to have um, more engagements so that we can uh, educate uh, the masses out there. There are people who, uh, apart from <clears throat> uh, the misconceptions, the people who don't really believe in Islamic finance or even Islamic banking for that matter in particular. And therefore, uh, there's really a lot that needs to be done uh, in this area. And uh, more specifically uh, about what has been discussed today is that we have uh, majorly discussed um, you know, indices uh, and stocks, whereas there are quite a number of other uh, investment opportunities even locally here. Uh, that are available uh, to the market, uh, to the Muslim populace, uh, that uh, we have not even scratched you know, the ground. Uh, maybe to just mention uh, things that are locally available here, uh, the merry, merry go-rounds that uh, you know, people have. Uh, I think Robert mentioned maybe, uh, or rather it was actually in the, in the, in the question, uh, questions, uh, circles. Uh, and then now we have uh, things like uh, REITs, um, and therefore, as um, I conclude, uh, I would I would say that there is a, there is really a, a lot that needs to be done in this area. I understand that um, we were now discussing maybe in Dovu and uh, Wahid, uh, you know, offerings and what they have, and of course that is important. 
because uh, right now we don't have uh, any firm that has provided uh, Sharia screening uh, services. I know there was a Genghis Capital. Uh, I don't know whether it is still there and if uh, you know it is providing these services. Uh, so all in all, uh, thank you very much for having me. And uh, I hope we are going to hold these uh, engagements uh, to educate the masses and also enlighten ourselves uh, in this area. Uh, probably uh, my concluding remark, uh, based on what had been asked about um, what is happening to the stocks, uh, they're going down, I don't know, 6.4% or 7 point something a percent. Um, I read, um, and I, I love reading, and I remember reading uh, a book by Nassim Talib about, you know, investments, and this is something that he mentions uh, in particular, that when you look at the markets, you know, markets uh, uh, in any given year, and now you're looking at a particular week or even a particular month, you are bound to have, you know, a heart attack because either the market is going down or it is going up. And that is not the way of uh, looking at investment. Uh, an investment, you look at it, you know, uh, the long haul. Uh, so probably in a year, how it has performed or in two years, rather than in one particular week, then you're bound to uh, make mistakes. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sheikh Badru Jafar. Have I forgotten anyone? Um, Alex, your remarks, Alex? Uh, thank you, Omar. Uh, thank you for the panelists for an engaging conversation and also for the attendees for your time. Uh, so my parting shot is I'll share this recording uh, with everyone in attendance so that you can just make reference to the enlightening conversation that we had this evening. Other than that, uh, have a great uh, evening. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Alex. Um, my sincere gratitude to each and every one of you tonight for joining us. And uh, investment is a journey. Learning is a journey. Um, as we all know, Islam is the religion of reading, the religion of Iqra. So we have to enlighten ourselves. We have to keep on learning each and every day. Um, I remember once how I got to meet and uh, know Sheikh Badru Jafar was uh, when I met him or, or when I saw him in 2014, um, my little story yeah? um, about uh, at the journey of faith seminar at uh, KICC. And I was shocked to see the first Sheikh using a tablet giving khutbah. I don't know if I've told you this, uh, Sheikh Badru, but um, I was really fascinated and I wanted to know who's this Sheikh. I'm a talker. Is he really Kenyan? And uh, I got to learn about you. I got to, to meet you. I got to learn that uh, you're in the Islamic finance field. Um, I got to have my interest in Islamic banking and finance. And uh, I remember asking you, Sasa, what is the difference between interest and profit and uh, Zotani ni percentage? And Alhamdulillah, 2014, we are in 2022. Um, it's been quite a journey, alhamdulillah, and uh, I pray each and every one of us tonight as uh, attendees, we can get to, to, to say that uh, in the next few months um, or a few years that uh, we got to learn a lot about Islamic finance. And as Kenyans, 15 million to 16 million Muslims um, with little um, available avenues for us to invest, that's really sad. And uh, the onus is on us now to keep on uh, teaching people, keep on um, um, asking questions, keep on learning, keep on sharing knowledge so that we can invest and uh, really um, become rich, by the way. Because as a Muslim, how are you going to go for Hajj if you don't have money? How are you going to be able to give zakah if you don't have money? How are you going to be able to help your family um, without money, it's really impossible. And um, that's one aspect, uh, that's one way of me looking at uh, investments. And inshallah, I hope we are going to learn and uh, be better in this journey together, inshallah. And hopefully we are going to host more um, enlightening talks in the future, inshallah. Um, with that, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Good night.